This is Will Smith from Artificial Brain. This is Lariah Hayes from Chaotica. This is Alex from Lisa Eyes. This is Sam from Your Chance to Die. Hi, everyone. This is Fernando from Moonspell, and you're listening to the Great Metal Debate Podcast. Rock on. Right, nice guy. Hey podcast listeners, welcome back to the show for another Metal Artist interview. I'm here with Alec Roja and James Benson from Melodic Death Metalers, Amiensis. Guys, thanks for coming on The Great Metal Debate. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So, guys, I was fortunate enough to see you all play just a few weeks ago on the first night of Louisville Death Fest. Tell me, how did you guys become part of that festival? Uh, well, I was contacted actually directly by the promoter who um, probably some of the listeners might have seen some of these stories over on Metal Injection, uh, where we were quoted. Also, I think Metal Sucks might have posted something as well. But uh, we were invited by AJ Lucas, the promoter, um, and he, he contacted me directly instead of through our email or through our Facebook. Uh, and I'd actually talked to AJ once or twice about booking another one of my bands when I came through Louisville or earlier in the summer. Uh, and so he hit me up, I think, around March uh, and asked if I wanted to be a part of it and then kind of listed off some of the bands that were going to be involved. And I said, yeah, that sounds great. Awesome. And you mentioned that there was some controversy surrounding the festival. I, I, I'm curious, kind of, I, I know when I learned about it as a fan who was there watching, but at what point did you guys kind of get wind that maybe there was something amiss? Um, well, this is probably a good time to tell kind of our, our side of the story. Alec and I, and I believe um, our guitarists who filled in, Nick, uh, and I think Chris were in the van at about maybe – Somewhere between midnight and 12.30. Uh, on um, actually, before we even get to that, it. it actually goes back even further. Does it? Uh, because <clears throat> I will just interject. It's a, the only reason I'm doing this is because we all did actually get a slight scent that it was going off, and it's kind of funny, because they posted the transitioning times between the bands, and this was before we even oh, yeah. got to Louisville. Yep. And there was only 10 minutes in between each setup. And so I'm kind of like looking in the group chat and I'm like, okay, so we have 10 minutes and there's like how many bands and they right. expect us to change at every interval of 10 minutes. And I was like, Jimmy, I think we're probably going to end up playing at 730. We're supposed to play at 520. And he's like, no, no, it's not. No, I was like, okay. I was like, no, <laughs> so I bet, I bet, you know, every, every show runs late. I was like, probably like six. Yeah, and then we get to the venue, and that's when we, you know, they actually had put pushed it back a little bit further because I think one or two bands dropped from the first day initially. I think Sunlight's Bane was the band, um, and at that point we got moved back to maybe like six ten or six twenty we were supposed to play instead of like five forty initially, and we actually went on probably closer to eight yeah or eight thirty. Yeah, almost. Which which was okay for us, but I mean, before we even started, I was like, "Hey guys, like, let's cut the first song. Let's cut the right. first song yeah, and make sure this goes." About yeah, the set. exactly. Yeah. So sorry, where where my story actually begins was towards the end of the first night at twelve between twelve and twelve thirty. I remember because I came out to the van and uh, Nick and I think uh, Alec and Chris were already in the van. Uh, and that's when, now this is six hours after the show began, that's when we knew things were really off by that point. I think there were f four or five bands left at 12 o'clock when Anagnorosis was supposed to have played at 11, uh, <laughs> and by the time they would have played, it could have been 4 a.m. technically, but we heard we heard some of the other bands, and I don't want to name names, they were, they were actually not foul-mouthed. Uh, they were not being... I mean, mean. They were assertive, uh, perhaps a little bit aggressive, but they weren't using aggressive language. Uh, and they were bands that were left to play uh, and bands that had not gotten paid already. And we were one of them, but I'm one of the bands that did not get paid. But 
we initially we we basically heard the conversation go, and the bands were upset that a that they were some of them were going to have to play so late and going to have to reschedule for the next day, which did end up happening to an agorosis, or b that they hadn't gotten paid yet, and he was he was saying, all right, well this is all I can do, I'll pay you tomorrow. Um, and he, he basically stood there like a sad puppy the whole time, most of the time. And I think that's when we saw Kayla actually step in and, and start to run things for him, uh, at that point. And we didn't know until the next morning, Saturday morning at around 10 o'clock when I got a message from Mike Lowe from In Fury and, uh, Obliet. And Mike was like, Hey, by the way, he's supposed to be at the venue to pay the venue at one o'clock. And so we were like, all right, we'll, we'll be there. We'll see, we'll see what's going on. Cause we had already planned on attending day two. Um, so yeah, that's, that's when we got the whiff of things not going wrong. And obviously we went to look for him after we saw him being surrounded by like three or four bands, different bands members. Though it was probably only like five to six people in total. And, uh, right next, which is right next to our band. And we went to find him after that to see if he could pay us anything. Like we, I mean, we had to drive, actually, so our, our bass player and our, our guitar player live in St. Paul, which is about 90 miles from where I, Alec and I live here in Rochester, Minnesota, southeast. And then we drive to get Chris, who lives in Green Bay, which is about four and a half hours east of us. And then it was about an eight and a half hour drive from Green Bay to Louisville, and we had to do that twice. So I have to ask, you know, uh, did you all end up receiving most or anything that you were promised as far as payment, uh, benefits, etc. For, for playing the fest? Uh, we have gotten thus far directly from AJ uh, half of our guarantee which was um, not a lot to begin with because I kind of maybe timidly accepted. I was like, okay, this is a pretty big fest, I understand, and so I accepted a guarantee that we would normally basically take for any show. Um, meaning like a show that we would play within two hours maybe of where we're from. I mean, any any show for us is like not like any show for a band that has its members in like a decently small radius. So it's already it's already a, a, a fest basically any time we play a show because it has to take a lot of coordination. But he paid us half, and Kayla gave us a, a a couple bucks. I mean, a little more than just a couple bucks, but a little bit to help with gas on the way back. I mean, I filled up like a quarter of our tank because we have a a van, so. It was good. It was nice of her because at that point, you know, obviously I paid gas straight up myself the whole time. Yeah, she actually kind of made it a lot easier for us to yeah. to, sur- to survive, you know, the trip home without having to really go broke as a result of the whole thing. So it was a good thing uh, that she did. Like, yeah, like 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 I said, like the the night Friday night. I actually remember a couple of people asking me where he was. Like they were like, "Well, have you seen the promoter?" And I'm like, "No." <laughs> but 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 I mean, we just kind of just kind of went with it. But overall, the whole experience though was was great. I mean, we got to meet a lot of different people. We got to a lot of the bands there we knew of. And so. I and I'm glad you yeah. guys came because I was super stoked to see you all, and and you didn't disappoint. Uh, just, before we leave this topic, I am curious. If there was a promoter who was listening to this podcast, kind of, what, what would you say on behalf of bands like Ambiensis who, you know, you're kind of, you're going out on a limb, taking a trip to a distant city, distant state, you know, what, what should they know about your situation and kind of how should they handle situations maybe when they aren't optimal? When they aren't optimal? I think being transparent, I, I might have sympathized a little bit with AJ if he hadn't waited until four days after not showing up to the second day to post on Facebook uh, and say that he had an emergency and that's why he didn't make it on Saturday, despite I never, you know, a lot of the people like Kayla and some of the other people, like one of the guitarists in Tyranny and Throne, or sorry, the drummer in Tyranny and Throne and stuff, and then the vocalist of Anagnorosis, they took over and they've met the kid. Um, and I know the, the drummer of Tyranny and Throne made the sh- second day happen by going to AJ's house and never did I hear anything about there being an emergency. So transparency, you know, if you're if you're like, hey, funds funds are pretty bad, and and or you know whatever whatever the issue was, I I'm not quite sure. Some people are saying it was attendance. It didn't seem that badly attended. I mean, it seemed like there was a lot of people there. So I think there was no organization. That was what failed him. 
And if that's the case, he needed to own up to it. And I would have been okay. I mean, sure, I would have been a little salty, but yeah, I mean, I would have, I would have understood. And I would have just asked him, you know, hey, what's the, what's the course of action here? I, you know, if, if he was like, well, this band traveled from this far, uh, and I really need to try to pay them as much as I can, I would have been like, cool, I get it. Um, us as a band personally, I mean, we all work full time pretty much and have pretty dependable jobs where, Yes, this was, you know, a, a little bit of money to, to go out and play, but did it bankrupt us? Not, not even close, really. So, I mean, baby, her, just just working with the bands and being transparent about it would have would have worked fine. I, I don't think I met any any of the bands. None of them were actually throwing a hissy fit. None of them were being divas that I know of. Um, were some of them pissed off? Yeah, but none of them were acting aggressively. No. So, yeah, I mean, really, it's, it kind of boils down to two things. It's basically, uh, on one hand, you, you need to plan financially. So if this is a message to all promoters, I mean, the obvious thing is you got to make sure that you actually know what you're doing when you plan the thing. Mm -hmm. And then you don't have to lie and <laughs> make, up, <laughs> make up stuff. You know? Yeah. And then, then the other side is if you do make a mistake, the more, like he said, I, I agree 100%. You know, the more transparent you are, the more likely things are actually going to go better and people are actually probably willing to help you more in that situation right. as well. So if he, if he had done what Kayla did and stood up on the stage and been like, hey, guys, we really, need to, uh, we really need to help out these bands. They've traveled really far. You know, I'm going to take some donations. Please buy merch. If he, if he had actually done that on Saturday... Wow, it would have been different. Yeah, it would have been a lot different. Well, I mean, had he showed up at all Saturday, it would have been different, but still. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, that's what what Alex said exactly. You know, if you have, if you have twenty five, thirty bands coming and you owe them ten, fifteen thousand dollars in guarantees, don't wait until the day of the first show to find out if you might make enough for the guarantees. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's like it's like putting a deposit on a house. For God's sake. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you don't you don't go to your you know mortgage lender of choice and say, I think I'm gonna have ten thousand dollars to put down on this house, but but I don't know a hundred percent if I'm going to, so I might just disappear. Sounds like some common sense just should rule the day, and and then beyond that, just honesty and trying to work with people instead of running away from problems. Exactly. I mean, it's it's easier said than done, that's yeah. for sure. Well, despite all the headache for you guys, I'm still so happy that you all made the trip and came to Louisville Death Fest because it was my opportunity to see you all live. I had heard your music before, but seeing you all live was an even greater experience. For folks who aren't familiar with Amiensis, can you give us a brief sketch of how the band came together initially? Um, Alec, you want me to, or do you want to talk? Well, I'll start with how we, we met each other and when we started doing music. Like, basically, uh, like, we had known each other from high school, and me, I'm Alec, the, who does the guitars and all that stuff, and Jimmy, who does most of the vocals, we knew each other in high school and we were both really interested in doing some kind of metal band like it was the thing that we both wanted to do like at that point in ninth and tenth grade we already knew that this is what we were going to be doing yeah. um and so we took whatever we had we just recorded as much as we possibly could with as little time that we had like we we just put we didn't even necessarily know exactly what sound we were doing we just know that we wanted it to be heavy and have a lot of screaming and a lot of guitars and a lot of keyboards and a lot of blast beats. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so we just kind of kept going and going and going. And we had Aaron, and he was the other guy, and he actually settled down and got married and is probably, <laughs> is probably completely done with the band now, but he definitely was integral in founding kind of our clean vocal side of things and mm -hmm. our acoustic stuff. But we wanted to blend the beauty elements like the, the tamer stuff, the acoustics, uh, and the clean vocals with the brutality and the the dual guitar harmonies and all of that stuff. Um, 
So it took us a few years to finally narrow it down to what you hear in amiensis, but I would say we really got everything down in probably 2011 or 2012 is when we really finally started to know what we were exactly what we were going to sound like. Yeah. I don't know if you want to weigh in on that at all, Jimmy. But. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, as far as far as how the band is nowadays, I will say that Alec and I are really the only two that have been in it for a long, really long time. Um, but I mean, even even with that being said. We haven't really divulged a whole lot from what we re- originally set out to do about ten years ago when we met. So yeah, like the basic idea. We was, just got better at it, I think. Right. Yeah. The <laughs> basic idea was it was symphonic black metal. Yep. Um, and we wanted to tame the underlying flaws that we kind of felt were were kind of a thorn in the symphonic black metal side, which was that the keys were a little bit too much a lot of the times. And like the, some of the sound effects that they use are, are a little bit on the cheesy side. And, and we know that cheesy is a really a subjective thing. But, yeah. but to us, it was like we wanted to kind of own craft where we have a massive dynamic range from pure acoustic and, and clean vocals all the way to total uh, black metal like um, to the extreme end of the second first and second wave black metal sound um, from Scandinavia and all that so so I would say that that's that's kind of where we are now but yeah now that that's interesting when I saw you all on stage at Louisville Death Fest you said something to the fact that uh, you were maybe the least heavy band there so how, how does that kind of fit with the uh, idea that uh, of, of where you all fit as far as the spectrum of metal subgenres. <laughs> I think that like varies practically by song most of the time. I will say I mean like it, we've had we've had a lot of songwriters in the band over the years uh, and I will say that now it's down to really like two or three of us that that write the songs. Um, well everyone everyone writes at least their own parts but regardless I mean like when usually, when, usually when a song comes together, we have one or two main writers who write most of the guitar stuff. So in the past, it could have been like four or five different people per song and like four or five people per album writing an entire song almost by themselves. So, I mean, I think you saw it with All Pass Lead to Death, our last album, but that was like an intentionally way more focused and stripped down album. Like we were like, okay, we want to put this out because – this is what we've been into, and this is what we wanted to do for a while, so we're going to do this. Um, yeah, we basically, we chipped the scales much farther toward the consistent extreme uh, yeah. Norwegian black metal sound while still maintaining all the core elements that we had before. And so what we did with All Paths Lead to Death was let's, let's take five songs and... Um, have it be tipped as far as it possibly can go in that direction with, and still be amiensis. Yep. Um, and so that's what we did with that. But as far as like comparison to the other bands, it, it was primarily a death metal festival. Right. And we have kind of, we, we're more, a little bit more progressive than, than just that. So it's, it is a, a bit of an unfair characterization to say that perhaps it's, it's less heavy. But like Jimmy said, it varies a lot from song to song. Yeah. So the kind of the joke, I guess, really is just that we're we're the less heavy because because we're not just straight death metal. Right. And I and I will say, I mean, our presentation on stage usually isn't like, you know, a, a, your average black or death metal leading band. We uh we have fun. I mean, that's that's kind of it. That's why I always introduce this as just a rock and roll band because I mean. I mean, I think when I'm on stage, I try to emulate Robert Plant more than anyone. <laughs> yeah, I will say that that your your stage uh, persona or the 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 stage the feel that you guys generate on stage is, I mean, it's very energetic, but maybe it's not as brutal, so to speak, as some other bands. Even though the music, I think, is just as brutal. Yeah, and it definitely can be. I, I mean, we we had some pretty we didn't play our softest songs, but we played some of our heaviest songs, and we still played some of our more like melodic, almost basically folk metal stuff too. 
at some point. So uh, that's that's the range we span, though, in interests and and in writing style. So I mean, uh, basically, our our mantra from beginning to whenever this band might end is play what you you know play what you want and what feels good, and we'll try to incorporate it. Well, let's talk for a moment, uh, focus in on the album you talked about, uh, the recent five-song EP, All Paths Lead to Death, released just this year. Tell me, what has been the response so far to that EP? Um, the response has been really interesting and I would say almost overwhelmingly positive. Um, the, the thing that is a recurring theme is some people are... Uh, surprised and some people are saying that it actually is a significant change in sound um, but for me personally um, I actually I understand and empathize with what they're saying but I believe that the only reason why the sound is so different is mostly because of the mixing and mastering um, the mixing and mastering is a different style. It's a different tone in the guitars and uh, a much less sort of quantized and edited sound. It's much more raw. Um, and people notice that, and a lot of people actually really like that, um, which is which is good. Um, and uh, people also feel... Some, I've seen some people, and this actually kind of makes me happy. I've seen some people react to the really aggressive and dark sounding songs and saying, wow, this is, you know, this is really, this is kind of where I was hoping you guys would go, what I would want to hear more out of from you guys. And uh, that's kind of uh, what I was hoping to hear from at least some of the people who were interested in kind of exploring that darker realm within our, uh, the scope of our music. Um, so, yeah, I guess overall, um, people have a lot of different things to say, but like I said, it's been overwhelmingly positive. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Now, you all have released a couple of full-length albums before. Why did an EP, just five songs, make sense at this point for the band? We, I think, that, you know, at that, at that point when we started writing, it was after we first started touring, because we were a band for, like, way too long before we ever played any live shows. Though so back in the day before we were officially Amiensis, we played some stuff. Uh, but in any case, I mean, I think I think it was based on like, okay, we've done this live quite a bit now. What do we want to play live? <laughs> and that was like that was the point of the album is like, we want to play this live, so let's write songs we want to play. I mean, like not not to say that I don't like playing things off of our other albums because I absolutely love them. Um, but yeah, it was definitely one of those things where it was like we kind of intentionally, and we've we've said this before, um, we intentionally laid off of the amount of keyboards for our live tracks, uh, and we intentionally laid off of like the clean vocals a little bit too. Um, so that was also part of the songwriting, I think. It's like, when it came down to it, I was like, eh, I could, I could put some oohs and ahs in here like I have in the past, or it could just be me yelling ah. <laughs> yeah. For listening to it from a fan perspective, I'll tell you, I, I could hear those elements, but you didn't come off as like Nightwish. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what I was actually referring to a little bit before, where we're like, okay, we don't want to overdo the symphonic mm -hmm. element. Yeah, because the keys, what we decided to do with this one is where it absolutely needed it the most was probably the last song. Um, yeah. Because that song was formulated, it was supposed to be similar to like Arise and some of the other songs we did where it has the full range of uh, emotion. So we did put actual orchestral sounds in there. Mm -hmm. But for the rest of it, it was like, we want to focus on everything that we can replicate live and not have any of it be lost in the acoustics of the venue. Like we, we didn't want anything to be lost in translation where we have a million different things going on and people can't actually appreciate it or hear it. So we wanted to kind of condense the formula a bit just so that we have some material that we know people are going to 
jump onto right away and say, wow, that sounds good. Well, I think that the EP, which I was uh, happy to buy when I was there at Louisville Death Fest from you, and uh, it's been in a big rotation on my MP3 player since that time. Excellent work, guys, on that material. But you mentioned to me that you guys, even this evening, have been working on new material. Tell me a little bit about that. Oh, okay. Um, man, well, this summer, you know, right at pretty much within the month after we released the EP, we we're like, yeah, it's probably time to start, uh, time to start going. So, uh, you know, we didn't, for once, usually we have some B-sides and stuff that we revisit that don't get included on an album. But this time it was kind of like, let's just start over and try something else. Uh, and we, we kind of had a, a vision in mind of where we wanted to go with it sound wise, but we didn't have any, we didn't have necessarily anything written at that point. We just knew, okay, these are some of the elements I think that we were missing from previous albums, or this is some of the good things that we want to incorporate from previous songs and albums that we've, that we've done. Um, but obviously we don't want to copy that by any means. We just want to get the, the essence of that uh, emotion. So continued, but in a different song. Uh, and so we identified kind of some of those emotions and strengths and weaknesses that we've had on the previous stuff and just kind of started going. And it's been a hella nice, like three months or four months now of, of writing that we've been, I think more productive than in any period in the band. <laughs> really? I mean, we've, we've gotten about eight songs, um, fairly well demoed to the point that we're now, demoing beyond i mean we're doing vocals and actually recording some drums live drums for for everything instead of programming so it's been doing really well alec you want to add anything oh uh, yeah it's uh i would say kind of the same thing we because of what we did with the ep um we we're all wanting to go back to some of the essential styles in restoration yeah um that one had very very good reception and it also has some of the most essential framework for for what enhances sounds like mm -hmm. and so we wanted to simultaneously grab those elements and also broaden the horizon even further so we're taking a lot of clean vocals a lot of complex parts and acoustics and clean guitars and all that and we're adding um, a more diverse range of darker and stranger kind of emotions mm -hmm. um, and kind of putting them all into um, these eight songs. So we're having some of it be extremely dark and kind of foreign and kind of exotic sounding, and then some of it is some of it is more classic and kind of uplifting, like restoration type vibes, and then. Other ones are just, you know, straight evil, you know, like, like we always, you know, we've always gone for. But, but yeah. yeah, that's what we're, that's basically what we're doing. Yeah. Sounds like fans from back at the Restoration era will be pleased, but also newer fans like myself who were introduced to you through All Paths Lead to Death will also find things to enjoy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, guys, I... Uh, I, I do want to ask a couple of questions. Uh, you all are, you mentioned earlier that you're headquartered in Minnesota. What's the metal scene like in that upper, upper Midwest section of the U.S.? Um, you know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm a part of kind of two or three different scenes in that aspect. Um, you know, I'm, we're, we're really not a part of a music scene ourselves because we're, one, because we're kind of spread out, uh, you know, there's two of us at most in most city or in a city. And uh, secondly, because really Minneapolis, St. Paul is the closest scene. And when only ha like two fifths of the band is from St. Paul, it's kind of hard to be lo considered local, if that makes any sense. So uh, a lot of the shows that we get offered are by people that know us online or it's it's hard it's kind of hard to say like we we get offered more shows out of state almost than we do in state 
So, I mean, I think, honestly, I play more in Wisconsin than I do in Minnesota. But we're, we're about an hour from Wisconsin, so that's not that far. It's about an hour and a half to Minneapolis-St. Paul. So I'm actually, I'm actually closer going to Wisconsin than I am to Minneapolis. And so is that, how, how is the health of metal there? I mean, are there, are there a fair number of local metal bands out of that area as well? Yeah, no, I, I mean, as far as, now, Rochester, no. Um, most of the bands from Rochester are started by either members of Amiensis or former members of Amiensis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you are all the generators of the scene. Yes. Yeah, that's uh, part of the reason why we actually wanted to do it in the first place, really, yeah. was because that was what attracted to us about metal was the absolute novelty of it in Rochester. Yeah. Like, because for us, it was it was literally our meat and potatoes, yep. like, every single day. And any time we would show it to another human being, they would just look at us like, what the hell's wrong? <laughs> yeah. And that was what we liked about it. Yep. So, I mean, it's, it makes perfect sense. Yep. But Minneapolis St. Paul has a has a pretty good scene for just about any genre yeah, you can think definitely. of. I mean, it's it's certainly good for black metal. It's certainly good for death metal. Uh, it's good for death core. It's good for you know Indian folk even. It's it's got everything really. Hip hop, punk, jazz, alternative rock and roll, butt rock. <laughs> and, and so that that uh, leads me to the question about I mean. On a bill like I saw you on Death Fest in Louisville, everyone's playing that same general style. Do you all feel comfortable playing in cross-genre concerts where you might be teamed with artists pulling from a variety of styles? Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, we we prefer we play a lot of genres of stuff, or we try to incorporate it with a hint of black metal in most stuff. But I mean, that represents why our music tastes are kind of pretty broad. Uh, we did we did a short like uh, four or five day run last year with a band called Pangea from uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and the probably the closest band I would consider them to be stylistically is like maybe between the Buried and Me. Yeah, or Periphery or a little. Or a little, yeah, a little like Periphery without the singing, but with you know kind of the keyboard elements of Between the Buried and Me. Um, and now they're good friends of mine, uh, and I've played with them a bunch of times with my with my other band too, and uh, that's how I got kind of got connected. But I was like, hey, this would be a really kind of proggy, you know, we're we're more proggy black metal, and you guys are like kind of more progressive metalcore, if I would consider them, you know, closest to any genre. Um, and it was great. I mean, like every night, there I don't think we played with a single black metal band. No, we yeah. did one, one in lacrosse. Yeah, that's that's right. it. We played with one other bla- like black metal band the entire time. So we certainly don't care. Well, guys, beginning to wrap up with you this evening. What's coming up for the band for the remainder of 2017 and maybe even into 2018? You've talked a little about working on new material. Tell us uh, a little bit more about the timeline and what we can expect for that. Uh, well, I guess I'll start. We we actually just uh, kind of Skype-ish chatted um, a little bit ago before you gave us a call here. Uh, and the band right now is actually going to have two different releases in 2018, uh, one being a full length and the other being a split with a band that we did a split with once before, if you catch my drift. Um, and that will come out before the full length for sure. So right now we're actually – about to start recording pieces of that um, for the final actual piece and then finish up kind of writing uh, some of the vocals and keyboard parts for it. Uh, but that's really exciting because it's been um, going on four and a half year or four years, I think, in November uh, since we did that split, and they're still really good friends, uh, and they've put out some freaking awesome uh, black metal albums since then, and they're from Minnesota. Uh, and we're doing it through a label that has actually done some of our stuff in the past uh, because they're really cool. But the the label that I'm talking about, so they're called Tridroid Records. Uh, they were owned by a guy named Andrew Rareberger, and Andrew was actually murdered. He was he's about our age. He's 25 years old. He was murdered last November, unfortunately, and he had passed the label on to uh, a woman named Christine Kelly, who. Uh, came and saw us at St. Vitus last year in New York, and we actually stayed with her up at her house. But she had taken over the label from Andrew shortly before he got killed, which was 
very sad. Uh, and now we've co- you know connected with her on the same level that we connected with Andrew. So I mean, we count ourselves pretty lucky to work with them. Uh, and you know, we we're really glad to do something with the same label again, despite the tragic you know event of Andrew's passing. So. But beyond beyond the split that we're going to do here, we will have uh, a new full-length record out uh, in the fall of 2018. And we will be announcing a new signing on a new label in the near future. Um, let's just say if you went to the Louisville Death Fest, you might be familiar with them. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yes. Indeed. So... That's, that's Alec. Do you want to add anything for for plans? We are we are planning a, new, a tour as well, um, pretty shortly following probably the release of our album. Yeah, we're going to be going to Europe. Yep. Well, that's very exciting for you guys. I mean, I, to me, I, I think that your music is as good as it is in the states. Here is custom made for a European audience. I think you will find a a warm reception there, in my opinion. I hope so. We, we found a really cool um, promoter, and it was kind of by chance. I think I posted on Soar, the um, folk metal band from uh, Scotland. Oh, on, yes. Uh, they're awesome. I posted on their status, and their, their, one of their agents hit me up. And we started chatting, uh, and we video chatted several times since then, talking about setting up this tour. But uh, they're, I mean, he's, he's great. So I'm really excited to meet him and, and meet some of the Soar guys, hopefully, as well, while we're over there. Um, but we are going to be bringing along our friends Ashbringer, uh, and Ashbringer just signed a Prosthetic Records. So we're really stoked. We toured with them the first time we, we did any tour, and they're all like five or six years younger than us, which makes us feel old, despite the fact that we're all under 30 still. So <laughs> I'll be excited to hear the stories when you get back. Sounds like that'll be a great one. Well, finally, guys, what is the best way for fans to purchase music and merchandise, including the latest EP, All Paths Lead to Death, from Emiensis? Our best form, and this has always been our best form, is through our band camp, uh, which is just Amiensis, A-M-I-E-N-S-U-S, dot bandcamp dot com. Uh, we technically don't have any other web stores uh, that link directly to the band, uh, if you do purchase through, say, Apathia Records, who put out our EP, you know, obviously we do have a contract with them, so we get some of it. And I do say support Apathia because they have some really, really great progressive bands on that label. Uh, and I, we're going to France on the, in Europe, and I really, really hope to connect with some of the other Apathia bands because they're really good. Uh, but otherwise, Bandcamp is the best. We we will be launching a, a amiensis.bigcartel.com in the future for our vinyl. Outstanding. Well, I'll just say once again, I got to pick up my copy of your EP at Louisville Death Fest. It's been in constant rotation for me. It's excellent. Well worth the money. I encourage folks to buy this album online, or even better, if you see an upcoming show, go meet these guys. They're super cool, and pick up the album from them in person. Well, hey, guys, again, thanks so much for taking the time. It's a pleasure to talk with you guys. It was even better to get to meet you and see you kill it on stage at Louisville Death Fest, and I'm looking forward to the day that I get to see you guys once again, hopefully sometime very soon. Yeah, hey, uh, we really appreciate what you do because this is getting the music out to other people who probably haven't heard us before. And every time you do that for another ba- or bands like us, an angel grows its wings. 